Welcome back to the channel, guys. Today we have a 63 Lincoln that you guys have been asking on paint questions. We have done a lot of metalworking, we've done body work, but we don't really have any video going in depth on the actual paint process. Do you paint the car together? Do you paint it apart? Do you have tape lines? Do you not? So what we're gonna do today is basically dive into every single thing all the way from sealer, base coat, and clear coating the car all of the details that we do, how much paint does it take to do a car this size. Everything's in the booth right now. It's already masked off. It's been cleaned with wax and grease remover. It's had waterborne cleaner. We've tack cloth the whole car down and we're ready to basically start shooting with our sealer. Now, what is the reason that we actually need a sealer? Because some guys use it, some guys don't. We didn't used to always use sealer, but we do now. And really it boils down to two things. You need to have one of two adhesions, right? Chemical or mechanical adhesion. And before I go deep down this rabbit hole of all the details that's gonna go into this, just keep in mind, this is not the only way. This is more of the restoration way. This is not really going to apply. And I know there's gonna be a lot of collision guys that probably have issues with something of my process. This is 25 years of screw ups really you name it i have screwed it up at some point so i'm going to give you guys a ton of tips on why i do things very specifically there is a lot of details and if you guys are in the middle of learning to paint i recommend on any of these videos that you watch the video try it then watch the video again you'll get something else out of the video every single time and going back to why do we seal well we finish the car off with 600 grit wet sandpaper. The color that we're going to be shooting today is going to be a high pearl context, uh, content. There's a lot of pearl in this color. It is a Chrysler 300 metallic blue and it has a lot of blue pearl. So I like to go at a minimum 600 to 800 grit to be able to shoot everything over. Now we're gonna seal because we're, we're putting the sealer into our 600 grit scratch and that's where we're getting our adhesion mechanically from our VP2050 epoxy high build, which is what is on the car right now. And then we are going to go over it with the ECS 87. This is Enviro baseline for PPG. It's what they prefer for that particular vibrance line to seal with. We're gonna be shooting uh, also in Virobase, we're gonna be shooting waterborne base coat. We're not gonna be shooting solvent base today. Sometimes every now and then we might shoot uh, solvent base and really it's just knowing why we use one versus the other. To me, I like waterborne, the metallics lay down better and overall when the paint is dry, you don't have as much orange peel or modeling. It's a very clean look. You have the mechanical adhesion when you seal and then you have a time frame per your TDS sheet. All of these products have a TDS sheet. It's a technical data sheet, and it is specific to that product. What pressure you shoot with your gun recommended, what time frame that you have to shoot it, down to when can you top coat it? How long is it open? And when I say open, meaning it's now going to get a chemical adhesion. So when we put base coat, over our sealer, you're then getting a chemical adhesion. You have about a 15 minute flash time for this particular product, and it's also dependent on your temperature and humidity throughout the day. I try to shoot all of our completes within a couple days. I'm different in, a lot of guys will put the car together so maybe they shoot the door jams and stuff, and then they back mask all your jams. I don't do that, I shoot everything completely separate we shoot the whole door inside, outside, everything at one time, so I don't have a tape edge or tape line. And even though this is a pearl color, we'll get everything to match uniformly, even with it being painted two to three different days apart. We're going to shoot our base coat over our sealer, and then we're going to be getting a chemical adhesion here. Not You can, not to say that you can't, you can shoot your sealer and then wet sand your sealer. But part of the reason that I don't like to do that is I like to get everything clean. And if you shoot your sealer and you find dust nibs here and there, 
you can always sand those out and then reseal that area. What a sealer is good for, especially with waterborne paint, is it's very finicky. If you're waxing, or I'm sorry, waxing, waxing grease remover and you're using your waterborne cleaner and you're wiping the whole car down, you might have hints of residue where maybe the rag was excessively wet. And what'll happen is, as you paint that color, it will show, it'll show up right away when you go to shoot that base coat over those areas. Where if you go over it with a sealer, you're now making the substrate one uniform texture, it's one uniform color, and depending on the color that you're going to shoot, you're going to want to tint your sealer per that color. For this particular color, this is a dark gray, almost a black sealer, because the color almost looks black, but it does have blue and the metallics and the pearls. So you'll actually use less paint by using this color sealer to go over. Also, if you have areas that are different colors or you've burned through a couple spots, there's going to be some things that we'll talk about in the booth to make sure that you do so you don't have soak up in different areas that you'll see later on as things dry. This is going to be a four to one to one. And this is my poor man mixing bank. I just use the drill hooked up to, you can buy these at your local paint supply. This is for their mixing bank. And I just cut the top off so I can hook a drill up to it and I can keep mixing this up. Sealer, you're not gonna use as much as you do the base coat. So we'll go through this process. I'm gonna mix up the four to one to one. Uh, you're always gonna wanna put the sealer itself into your mixing cup first, and then your hardener, and then your reducer as the lines fall. And by that, when you have these mix ratios on the cup itself, you'll look for your four to one to one, and you'll start with where your four is. So if, if you have all these numbers one through eight, I'll fill it all the way up to the eight on the four, with just the sealer and then you'll see another four next to it that'll be how much you fill it up with your hardener and then being the reducer you'll go to the third column and go to the other four that way you're always consistent you guys can mix this on a scale you can mix it just off the ratios i'm trying to give you guys a variety of different things if you don't have a big booth or a paint shop i've been doing this stuff for 25 years i've started in a three car garage and i can tell you today I can pull off the same finish in my garage as I do here in the shop with the booth. So we're gonna mix it up right off of the ratios on the cup. There are these cool lights. Forget where we got these, Amazon? Home Depot. These lights are adjustable, they're magnetic, and it just helps you see when you're pouring everything in. So there's our sealer in. This particular sealer is using the EH391 hardener. We're going to go to the very next number eight in the one column for the four to one to one. And because we're in good old Southern California, we have all these compliant issues. We get the D8767. They have different versions of all these different products per the state and the city you're in, I'm in the worst. And we fill that up with the reducer to the very last column, to the last number eight. Something that I like to do when I'm spraying a complete, not that I like to do, I make it a necessity, that we always take into consideration what our temperature is and what our humidity is. And the reason is, is this paint might react differently and how you spray it, how you set your gun up. So I try to make sure that my weather for that week, if I know it's gonna take me a day to shoot the body, a day to shoot the doors, and then you figure you got your trunk and hood that you're gonna have to spray the bottom side and then flip it over and do the top side, 
it's going to take me three days. Well, I look at the weather and try to find out what is the best week that I can do this. Well, we had two good days of weather yesterday and then today. Today we're going to shoot the body. Yesterday we did all the doors. In doing that, I know that today is pretty close to the same temperatures and humidities, but I jot this down for every customer car. I'll put it in the invoice to where I always have documented notes of how I mixed every single one of the products, how many coats, the gun setup, everything is critical when you're trying to get it to match all the way through when it's separated. That's why this is so important. Now, if your temperature varies a little bit, it's not the end of the world. You just don't want to be shooting one day and it's 60 degrees and one day it's 114 because that's really what we get here depending on the day. We've already mixed up our sealer. We're going to go in the booth and I'm going to show you guys some gun setup as well as things to consider when you have areas where there's maybe a little area of filler showing what are the pros and cons to that. All right, let's talk about why are we sealing? Well, we're sealing because every project's gonna be a little bit different. Maybe we have a cowl that we didn't strip. This car is kind of a mixed bag. We usually have everything stripped all the way to bare metal. This car was not done that way. And it's the last one that we're gonna do that way. However, because this is already blue, and this is gray, and then we come down here to the side, we have one little speck of filler showing through where we burned through while we were wet sanding. Well, what would happen here is, whether it be polyester primer or it be filler, they're both polyester, they're both porous, and what happens is things soak up more into them. All of this is VP2050 epoxy primer. It's a little different than your standard epoxy. It's an epoxy high build. So I use this in place of my polyester primer because I have so much mill thickness here that I can actually block it down. And I can even go all the way from, if I have enough, I usually put about three to four coats of this primer when I'm done with my body work. And we can actually block it out with 150 dry, 220 dry, and I can go from 220, uh, whether I want to use 320 or whether I want to jump to 600 wet, I can do all of that with this primer. But the reason that we seal is to take care of these areas. Now, can you just seal this and then let it flash and come in and base coat it? Yes, you can. But what will happen later as things dry is this little spot will soak up some of the sealer. So the trick is that you seal the car and have a mental note. Maybe you take a picture, so that way you know where these breakthroughs are. You let the sealer flash off from 15 minutes to an hour. After an hour, you're able to get in there and sand it depending on your temperature. But what I'll do is I'll come in with some 600 paper and I'll just wet sand this little area after I seal it. By doing that, I'm eliminating that edge from showing up as a halo. When things soak up into something that is porous, you will see it as things dry. But by giving it that hour dry time, the longer you can let it dry, the more you won't have those halos come back. But there's a pro and a con because if we wait more than eight hours with this sealer, I have to give it a mechanical tooth. I cannot rely on a chemical adhesion from base coat to sealer. So I want you guys to understand, read your TDS sheet and make sure you understand that I have a window that I can paint this car today. And if I'm outside that window of eight hours, I need to come back in and wet sand this car again to have the tooth. So I'm gonna go through and you can see here, we're trying to make the substrate, the car, all one uniform color. That's what the dark gray is for. It's going to make it where I use less paint. For example, let's just say this blue, this blue is the same color we're painting the car. So it's not as big of a deal. But right here, 
where you have these areas where there's primer and blue, you'll see that line because it's lighter. It will take twice, if not three times the amount of paint to cover that difference than if I was to just seal it. So how do you set up your gun? Let's go over that. I want you guys to notice that I have, turn that around for you. I use a diaphragm regulator. A diaphragm regulator, you're not going to see as much of a dip in the air pressure when your air compressor is kicking on and off. I have a water separator on the outside of the booth that uh, is a SADA system and it will completely trap all of the moisture. If you're a guy in your garage, like that's what I'm used to, I always have one of these little diaphragm water separators at the gun. It's just a last, uh, last point of anything that's gonna maybe get through. It's just a safety precautionary thing. I also like to put a swivel so that way I can put the cord above my shoulder and this isn't falling around. You always need to be mindful of your cord. So what I do is this is your needle. This is controlling how much paint flow is coming out of the gun. So what I'll do is I will turn this all the way in. Now I have air, right? But no paint. I cannot pull back anymore. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking a notation of where this is. Well, I shot the doors yesterday and I set this gun up to what I liked. And when that was for base coat, this isn't quite as critical for sealer, but here's the thing. Everything that we do with sealer is going to be a representation of how our finish looks after clear coat. If you spray the sealer and it looks like orange peel and it's not laying down nice, well, your base coat's just going to keep on multiplying. Then you put your clear on, it keeps multiplying more and more orange peel. So gun setup is what something everybody neglects to do. And well, how do you control when you're pulling that trigger? You're trying, most guys when they're first painting, they're very rigid and they have a hard time focusing because everybody's scared of getting a run or whatever issue. Well, eliminate all of those issues by setting up your gun for every single product you're gonna shoot. Do a test panel in an area that maybe isn't as critical so you can see the finish. I will dial, every time I use this gun, I go all the way out. This, this setting is for your fan. It's how big the fan is. Well, I want this to lay out nice and smooth. And I know for this particular gun, if I go in one turn, that it basically gets rid of a little bit of overspray on the outer edges. And if I don't have any paint coming out, I can count how many turns, one turn, two turn, and now I can see a little bit of paint coming out. I can start dry. So even if you want to start up here on the plastic, you can look at it and go, does it look too dry or does it look too wet? If we know we're going to do a 50% overlap, meaning whatever that fan size is, that is my fan size. If I adjust the fan in or out, this will get narrower to a bullet and be very heavy on the paint. So you have to adjust either one of these to get the flow that you like. The only other adjustment that you have is your air pressure. Well, your TDS sheet will also give you a parameter of air pressures to use, but every gun's a little bit different. So I already know that this is the gun I always use. This is an Iwata WS400 with the green cap. It's more of a base coat gun, but I use it for everything. Some guys will, I guarantee, chime in about how they like to use a separate gun. Well, I've been doing this 25 years, use the same gun. The only thing I use that's different is a primer gun because it's a bigger tip, it's a lot thicker product, and I need to be able to be sprayable. So everything you're gonna spray depends on that. This particular gun, most guys use a 1.3 tip. I have a 1.4 in this gun right now. That's just what I'm used to. Some guys like Sada, some guys like Iwata. It, to me, it's a Ford or Chevy deal. You either like what you like or what you started with. I'm an airbrush guy, I like Iwata. So I'm gonna put this around my neck um, and we're gonna seal the car and I'm gonna make a mental note. Right now I already know as I seal this car 
that that area of burn through is really my only spot that I have as a concern as I go through this. Everything else is going to seal just fine, but remember that's that's porous and I know that's going to soak up. So I'll just give it a little wet sand and I'll reseal it. Now as we set this up, if you guys are wondering what this apparatus is, if you have a booth like my booth is old, it's 30 years old, it's seen better days, it needs a, a, a cleaning, and the lighting is different. We got newer LEDs down there. Maybe you're in your garage, then this Luma 3 is an awesome addition. They sell them for specific guns, so make sure if you haven't bought a gun that you research what guns you can actually use with these lights. They're different diameters for different gun tips, but as I screw this in, there's rechargeable batteries inside. Boom, you now have light and you can see in some of the harder to get areas. As we spray the base coat, you're going to see this becomes very helpful on knowing where your modeling is, your stripes, your evenness. So once you figure out what the gun setting needs to be, how many turns out you like, I jot all of this information down, what the temperature, the humidity, how many turns out on the needle, how many turns out on the fan, what is my air pressure, all of those things matter to be repeatable. And the reason that matters is because, as you can see, we don't have any doors on this car. In order for this pearl to look perfect from this door to that fender and the quarters, you have to be a robot. I can't paint the car and then have one of my guys paint the doors and everything else tomorrow. So it's going to look different. My technique on how I hold the gun, my pattern, everything is going to be different person to person. So making sure you have a notepad or in your phone notes, putting all this information down is how you're going to get these panels to be the same. Waterborne paint can be a little bit finicky and as you spray it, it might take, you might see where, uh, if we were to go straight to base coat, you might see where we wiped something down, even though it's been cleaned. And if we seal it, now we have one uniform substrate all the way through and it makes the base coat process go a lot quicker and again use less paint. You just need to match the sealer with whatever color that likes to be put over. You can ask your paint shop that's local to you guys on what they recommend for that color using a sealer. So without uh, further ado, let's turn these lights on and let's check our spray pattern here. This sealer is a lot runnier than a normal primer. And you, as I spray this, see how it, it looks a little bit on the thin side, right? Well, I can dial this in a half turn at a time. Now I'm at two and a half turns out. Now you can see it's covering a lot better. What you want is that you want to be, if you're gonna do a 50% overlap as you spray, you want the first pattern to be just a touch. And I mean just a touch. This takes practice and not getting a run. Well, if I come through like a robot, and I say robot, but you need to be relaxed. I know a lot of guys are gonna poo-poo this, but I used to have a drink, grab a beer in between coats. If, it, if you're anxious or you're in your garage, take the anxious down, take your time, and just relax. There's no reason that you should have to rush this process, especially in this stage. Now, let's talk about the fan. See how I'm tilting the gun this way? That's because these horns are the air pressure coming out of the gun, which is making my fan this way. Well, if I want to go upright, I can flip these, and now I can hold the gun up and down and spray in these areas. What we're looking for here is a perfect wet coat, or as perfect as we can get it, without a bunch of orange peel. This is just to seal everything in. Don't forget to turn that back and then continue on. Here, we can flip it back up. You don't have to do this, but the more you can be consistent with your pattern, you want everything to one look like one big droplet of paint and no dry areas.
Me personally, I like to go around the car and do all of the hard to get areas first. So I get all of my rockers, my wheel arches, my door jams. What's cool about once you set this gun up, you always want to stay on the air. Keep your air on the entire time and it's a fluctuation of putting the paint on. You don't want to be on the paint the whole time pulling all the way back. You want to be on it, off it, on it, off it, and feather your edge. Otherwise, you're going to see areas in your metallics where it's really heavy, where you start and stop, because right there, you just float in twice as much paint. You have to have a little bit of finesse as you get maybe anywhere around a wiring harness, whisk it in there. But the reason that we set the gun up is so that way you can make this repeatable. If you don't set this gun up, you're gonna have runs and thick areas and thin areas well, what happens when we go to color sand and polish and you got all these thick and thin areas you're going to burn through? And if you're going to do a, a candy or any kind of other graphics, you should be practicing how you spray your car from day one. When you spray the first coat of epoxy primer, you're basically practicing then. So that way, by the time you get to do sealer and paint, you've already got it down pretty good. So just to recap, let's say you get a hair or a dust speck or something in this, let it dry for 15 minutes to an hour. Once you can touch it, you can totally come in here and wet sand a little spot, wipe it back off with wax and grease or waterborne cleaner, tack cloth it, and come back in and just touch it up with the sealer. The other thing is as you spray, some guys spray close, some guys spray far. If you're spraying close, I now have the ability for you guys who are machinists, I call it the speed and the feed. Well, you're feeding it paint and everybody's technique is going to be different. So just because this works for me does not mean this is going to work for everybody. You need to adjust the gun for your pace that you're comfortable. Me, I like to move fast and I like to be close. What that does is it allows me to put down a nice finish, move quicker, and because I'm not out here far, I'm getting a very nice wet bed of paint and I don't have something that's going to get dry. You don't want to apply any of this process where it's going on as a fog. When we get to the paint, you won't want to miss that because it's gonna, it, it's, we're gonna talk about how you set the gun up on the last coach so that way you don't screw yourself and get modeling.
Look at that. At this point, as you're doing your primer and your sealer, you can see if you've missed anything in your paint job. We really like to use, there's a product called Like 90. It's a paint check. And if you're, before you get the sealer, you can spray this over the car and what it's gonna do is let you see this reflection. We're paying attention to these lights and what you wanna make sure is that that light stays flat and the same. You don't wanna have it where it's doing a dip because there's a lot of guys say, oh, I do the same type of paint job. Well, I can look at a video and tell you just by what the reflection looks like or whether you're doing quality work or not. Using long blocks and technique is everything what we do. It's not something that you can just buy a block and achieve. It's all technique. Another thing you don't want to do is you don't want to have the gun tilted. You want the gun to be perpendicular to your panel because if you tilt it, it's now heavier here than it is on this side. Always spray perpendicular to the panel with a 50% overlap. I lock the panel so everything is uniform. We may not be doing a candy, but why not practice for it? The more you do with this, the better you're gonna get. Always keep in mind your air hose. Pull your air hose, take your time, don't rush. You don't want the air hose to grab the paper and rip everything off the car. So just take your time, walk around everything, get situated. Even if you need to do a test run, just practice without focusing. Find out where your air hose is gonna lay. Can you walk the panel without tripping on the hose? This matters when it comes to metallics and candies, it really matters. It matters because every coat gets darker or changes the look. So I'm gonna just continue for you guys, sealing the rest of this car up. Again, I'll just come back to that spot where the filler was, give it a quick little wet sand after it dries, retouch it, and now I won't have soak up in that spot. And then we'll start mixing the base coat. Hey guys.
All right, so we've got two coats of sealer on the entire car, and now we're gonna roll into the base coat. When you're doing the base coat, I want you to keep in mind this, what we're gonna talk about is very specific to waterborne paint, not solvent. Solvent is going to react very different, not to say that you can't do these steps, but the consistency of the paint is going to change. So when we're doing a big car, especially a tugboat of a Lincoln, we got two gallons to make sure that we have enough paint to do everything. It's actually a little on the excessive side. We're used to doing the whole belly and everything too, so that's why we always get two. Plus, if you ever have a problem or somebody nicks or keys your car, now you at least have extra paint. But as you go to your paint shop, wherever that may be, in this case, we went to Temecula Valley Paint. They're local to me, I've gone there forever. And to discuss how they mix it. Each one of the pigments to make up this color is in on a paint bank. As they put each, basically each color gives them a printout and it tells them how many parts that they put in of each color to make that particular color. Now you have variances too. For example, this is a Chrysler 300 metallic blue color. Well, there might be a few different variances of that particular color because of maybe where the plant was and where they made the paint. So what I wanna make sure and ensure is that I bought two gallons, which yesterday we mixed all of this together. So if I'm using this on a paint scale and I'm putting in a certain amount of droplets, I want to make sure there is no change between one gallon and the other. So what we did was we took a three gallon bucket we cleaned it out really good. We tack clothed it so there's no dust inside of it. I poured, I mixed these up thoroughly. We poured both gallons into that three gallon bucket. And while we were doing that, we have to use a little bit of the reducer. We don't have to. What I did was I wanted to make sure that every ounce of the paint, I don't say every ounce, I guess. I'm getting kind of crazy, but get the majority of the paint out of the bucket, out of the gallon can by taking a little bit of the reducer that you have to use for the paint anyway and splosh a little bit in there and mix it up so you get all of the majority of the metallics, the pearls, the pigment, all into the bucket. When you get it all out of both buckets, then you need to come up with the consistency. Now you've taken any kind of variance that you're gonna have from one gallon to the other and made them one. Then, with Waterborne, Waterborne is very finicky and you wanna use a DIN cup. This is a DIN 4. It's what the paint shop recommended. I'm no chemist. I go to the paint shop, we get the paint, and I look at a TDS sheet. So I don't know the chemical makeup of whatever, I just know that they told me what the viscosity is. The viscosity is how thick the paint is going through the gun and out the tip. Well, if we're shooting a 1.4 gun, gun tip, we want something that sprays really nice through that. So with doing this, we're gonna dip this into the three gallon bucket after it's completely mixed up really thoroughly. And we're going to pull it just above and start a timer. And what that timer needs to be for this per TDS is about 22 seconds, give or take. You can get it close if you're a little bit off, but remember, if we're not in a paint shop and I don't have more of the paint or more of the uh, actual makeup of the paint to make it thicker, you want to creep up on the viscosity, meaning we're going to thin the paint with a reducer. We're looking for 22 seconds from the time this comes out of the paint to the time that it drips. And when we started, we were around 40 seconds. So we, we slowly added about eight ounces at a time for the two gallon. It's just to get you guys that are in your garage more comfortable with not ruining, in this case, it was almost $2,000 worth of paint between just the pigment in these two gallons. Waterborne is a lot more expensive, but I feel like you get what you pay for when it comes to the clarity in this paint. Once you pull it out and you reduce it little by little until you get that 22 seconds, that is the viscosity that this paint likes to be sprayed in. If you go too watery, you're not gonna get the same coverage you need, it's going to spray exactly like water and you're going to have runs and thin spots and all that good stuff so once you get to where you need to be 
Most of the time, you could be done and putting it in your gun in spring. However, you have a window. We talk about mechanical, we talk about chemical adhesion, right? Well, what we're going to be using today, and a lot of guys don't do this, most collision shops don't do this, but we're going to be using the T493. This is a modifier. Uh, it's basically a 5% of hardener, again, per TDS. If you have this reduced, okay, what we did after we have everything done is I'm going, I, yesterday we sprayed the doors, the trunk, the hood, and some filler panels. I got as much stuff as I could spray because we've added reducer to that three gallon bucket and now I need to get some of that out of the three gallon bucket so it'll fit back in the two gallons we started with, right? So spray all those parts. Once you're done, mix the bucket up thoroughly and then pour it back into the two gallons. Put notes on top of the bucket, already reduced, already sprayable, ready to go. You do not want to add the modifier because it's a hardener. It's going to start making this more of a jelly. Obviously with 5%, it's not gonna turn it solid like you would clear by the next day. But what this is going to do is it's going to give you a longer window to top coat. Base coat being that it's a waterborne base coat, you need to make sure that all of the solvents the reducer that you're going to use, and I don't want you guys to get confused, this is not the reducer that we're using for the waterborne. That's the reducer we're using for the sealer and for the clear because they are solvent. You want to use a very specific waterborne reducer. This is your waterborne reducer. This is T494. This is what we were adding the eight ounces at a time, okay? So you're adding that in once you get to where you need to be we are sprayable, okay? We're poured back into the gallons. This is day two, we're gonna spray the body. We need the doors to match exactly with the body of the car. So we've been taking notes on our spray gun, right? We have all of our needle settings, our fan settings. I have to be the one spraying the car. If I shot the doors, I need to spray the body. I can't switch painters. I can't stress that enough. Everybody's gonna spray different and how that person holds the gun is going to make the metallics land differently. But going back to the T493 modifier, this is going to be put on a scale. We have an empty cup. I know people are gonna ask, this is a paint scale. It's the Sartorius is the brand. It's a paint scale. It measures parts and grams. We already have the viscosity. We've already reduced it yesterday. We know exactly where we need to be. I can go right into pouring this in the cup I want to clear the paint scale so that way I can measure how this is. It does not matter if you have the paint stick in or out. All that matters is that you have zeroed it with it in there and we're going to take whatever this amount weighs and we are going to add 5% of our modifier. Just take that number in your calculator plus 5%. That's how much modifier you're going to add to that base coat and now you are committed to that cup. You cannot throw that cup back in your gallon like you would do before with base coat. Before with it's reduced, as long as you don't use a hardener, you can pour it back in the thing all day long as many times you want. That's kind of the pro and con, knowing how much you're gonna spray that day. Obviously we're gonna spray a whole car, so I could do this in a bigger jug, have it all done and just keep pouring it in as I need. But I'm gonna do this per cup because I don't wanna waste any of the customer's paint. And from there, we'll put it in the gun and go right back through the exact same process with gun setup. You're gonna use everything that you used when you did the sealer, but you have to reset up the gun for the base coat. That is the most critical. The sealer really isn't as critical because it just boils down to the finish and the orange peel that you're putting on the car. This matters. We already know from yesterday that I liked two turns out on the paint needle and one turnout on the needle, and I set my air pressure for this viscosity, for this gun, and for my technique at about 38 to 40 PSI. Um, so we're just gonna put it right back to those settings, add our modifier, and jump to it. Before I forget, the other part of this is, you guys have a paint shaker at home, maybe it's one of those Harbor Freight jobs, you cannot shake waterborne paint. It, makes it too aerated and it ruins the paint. 
So you want to stir paint products. You can shake primers and all that good stuff, but when it comes to, you can even shake solvent-based paint, but really, I would get in the habit of stirring your paint products and shaking your primers. All right, we got the paint in the gun. We've added our modifier. We're gonna turn on our Luma light. I love this thing, especially in base coat. And we are going to repeat exactly that same process as we did with the sealer, but we need to make sure we have enough of this base coat on the car for coverage. We don't wanna do a paint job that's tiger striped or has modeling to it. We want something that looks exactly the same as the door. If it looks off, don't have the mindset that it's going to look any better with clear coat on it. It won't. So we're going to, we know yesterday we needed three coats of coverage. So with this gun set up at about 40 PSI, I know that I need three coats, 50% overlap to get it to cover. We're gonna make sure that we have the right flash times in between coats. So give it 10 to 15 minutes, per whatever your TDS sheet says, in between coats. Or you can do the tack test. You're not gonna have as much, you want the paint to be tacky, not stringy. So pick an area on a car that you can touch and it's not gonna affect your paint job. It's more in tune with your clear coats that you're gonna do that. Base coats usually dry so fast, by the time you get to the other side of the car, it's already drying. So again, we're, we're gonna talk at the end after our three coats about what you need to do to make sure you don't have modeling and tiger stripes and uniformity. There's a few things that we're gonna do to make sure of that. So here we go, raw footage. We're just gonna go around this thing and start sealing. Um, I've already set my gun up to exactly what I had yesterday. You'll also notice how bright blue this looks. That's the waterborne color. As the water leaves and it gasses off, it's going to look super dark, almost black. Waterborne paint is a lot runnier than what most are used to. Uh, if you're a solvent guy, take your time, learn the product. It is different, but I do like it a lot better.
If you're spraying and things maybe look too dry, well, what do you need to do if it looks too dry? You either need to increase your paint flow or slow down. If your paint flow and you want to move faster, add more paint flow and move faster. Again, this is not a setup that's going to work for everybody. You just adjust the gun to what you like. I don't know if it shows up in camera, but you'll see all the different stripes as we go through. That's because a lot of times if you're painting in an unlit area that's not very good lighting, you might think it looks good, but really there's tiger stripes all over this thing because the pigment in the paint is not thick enough. Being that this is a dark sealer, it makes this dark blue cover really easily. Don't be back far away from the panel where you're fogging it on because you're worried about the metallic. That's probably one of the most common things is people think, well, I'm dealing a high metallic color. I need to shoot from way back here with a higher pressure. It's actually backwards for what you would think. Go ahead and keep putting it on nice and wet. Let it look striped. Try to be very uniform with your coverage. Be the robot, as uh, Kosmoski would say, and go through everything very systematically as if it's a candy. When you get done with three coats, we'll talk about how we get rid of those tiger stripes and modeling. Also, as you paint, take the time to uncoil your hose so it doesn't slap the side of the car. And if we are doing a car that's apart, you always want to walk the entire length of the car. I will even set up all four doors in here where you have front door, back door being on the same side together. That way you're eliminating matching issues right out of the gate. And if you're walking the length of the car, you're spraying the same. Don't be the guy who sits here and sprays like this and then move over here. You can see, this ain't a body that's built for speed. I am overweight. I mean, I look like a blueberry, for God's sake. So take your time. You don't have to rush it. Just walk the whole length because it's going to make a big difference. Got the blueberry painting the blue car. How convenient. Having that sealer down just covers so nice right out of the gun. You're not struggling for coverage.
then you got these tight areas here. This might be where you adjust this fan, right? Big fan is going to get me a run out here, but if I narrow this out, I can focus the paint to go in where I need it. Just make sure you go back to your setting. All the way out, one turn in, and continue on. Alright, you're a beginner. This is your first paint job. You just got a big old run in the car. What do you do? Just stop. Let the, let the paint, or maybe just continue on painting the car. And then when it's dry enough to sand, come in there wherever your sag is or your run, sand it out. You're probably going to want to dry sand it because it's waterborne. So if you wet sand it with water, it's going to loosen this back up. Um, but anyways, you could wet sand it out and then just come right back in with good coverage over that area. It's just paint. If you mess it up, you get a bug in it, you get whatever in it, you let it dry, scuff it out. Adding that hardener or modifier to this base coat is gonna give you an extended work time to be able to top coat it with clear. So don't stress about it. Just come in and blend it back in and move on. I think a lot of people get overwhelmed. It's just paint, you're not going to the moon. Like for example, I don't know where the trash came in, right here, those little specks. But what I'll do is, Waterborne likes to dry with airflow. So I can sit here like this, and I could dry this area, especially if it's a hot day, which today is pretty moderate. I can go grab a blow dryer and dry this, and just grab the speck out of it, and then come right back through and paint on. So I'm not going to sweat that yet. I'll come back and make sure I get all those imperfections out. You could be the most quote unquote professional painter. We all make mistakes. You just got to learn how to fix them and move on.
So we're going to do this exact process all the way through three coats. We'll bring you guys back for the orientation coat or drop coat, whatever you guys want to call it. There is three coats right now on this car with normal spray pattern, 50% overlap. But this, most people would just clear this car and be just fine, especially with waterborne paint. It lays down really nice. Um, but as far as if you really want to ensure doing something all the way apart where the doors are off and the hood and the trunk are off, the great part about this is we can do what they call an orientation coat. There's all kinds of different tricks. I'm sure especially a collision guy would know way more than me on tricks to get certain blend outs and, and stuff like that. However, if you have all of the notations that you took notes all the way through this process of where your needle set, where your fan set, air temperature, or not air temperature, air pressure. What's great about that is if you have something happen, I can blend the paint out beyond the damage with the same paint, same settings, and have no problems. So now we're gonna orientate the metallics. What I want you guys to think about here, <clears throat> we put it on very wet and consistent and if you look at the finish of the fenders and all the rest of the car everything looks really pretty awesome but if we take the gun with the exact same settings the only thing we're going to change is we are going to change our air pressure from 40 down to about 15 PSI. And what this is going to do, a lot of guys have said, oh, that's putting it on dry and you're dusting it and you're not adhering. Well, let me rewind on that because as you put the, the air pressure down, what is happening? Well, the, the paint is not itemizing. In, in other words, it's a bigger droplet now if you use a bigger droplet, lower pressure, it's basically splattering it on the car, but it's doing it very finely because we have our gun needle and fan set up a specific way. Well, putting a bigger droplet, now what I'm going to do is I want to do not a 50%, but I want to do a 75% overlap. So a very tight pattern all the way through what that's going to do, and I'm gonna walk the panel just as I've been doing the whole time, all the way from sealer, base coat, now into the very last of the three coats. We're gonna do three. I think it's maybe a little excessive. You probably only need two, and I've gotten away with one, but we have the paint. I wanna make sure this thing looks perfect. So I'm gonna do three coats this way. I also am making sure that the, the three coats that I've already put on has completely flashed off and it's not extremely wet. So it's putting a bigger droplet. Now, if, if I was to turn the air pressure up, because logically that's what you think in your head, is that if I get back and I turn my air pressure up, well now my fan is huge and I'm gonna dust the whole car and make it look even, right? That's where we're gonna get rid of our tiger stripes and our modeling. But what it's doing is it's actually making the droplet very small and it's drying because you're out here and as you're dusting this yeah it might look uniform but we just took all this time making sure we had mechanical or chemical adhesion we do not want to introduce a coat of paint to this car that's not adhering well so that is why it's a bigger droplet it's wetter and that droplet is going to orientate the metallics so as long as we're watching that, we don't want those droplets to more or less connect. We want them to look uniform and tight pattern over the car because that is what's going to make the metallics look uniform panel to panel. That's why you have to be the same painter. If somebody else paints it, it's going to look differently. So I want to show you guys some examples here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do two coats over the entire car this way, the jams and everything. 
and I'm going to do the third just on the exterior panels. What's awesome about waterborne versus solvent based is waterborne, even though it's going on as a bigger droplet and it might look rough at first, when it dries, it looks dead flat. It's a pretty awesome looking car. So here we go. We're going to hit this with, again, 10 P or a 15 PSI. And don't change any other settings. We're going to flip on our light so we can see. Hopefully this shows up on the GoPro. Can you guys see how that looks? Hopefully. I am a little bit farther away from the panel than I was before. The biggest thing is making sure you get uniformity. Blend out your corners. Lock the car. Lock your shoulder. Walk side to side. You can kind of see that this part of the process goes much faster. Now, the other reason that I do the exterior only on the last run is because if I'm coming in here doing a jam with a bigger droplet like this, some of it's going to go over this edge and by doing that, the metallics will look different right here. So I'm gonna make sure that I always do the whole length of the fender last. I don't know if that shows up on camera or not, but you can see how I'm just doing the jam and it's actually hitting over into here. It's very little difference that's hitting, but <clears throat> it is a hit. If you were to do this with solvent-based paint, the finish doesn't come out quite as nice because it doesn't dry as flat. So we're gonna just do this, like I said, two full times around the car. On the third one, I'm only gonna do the exterior, and then I'm going to shut the lights off in the booth grab one of those small sunlights or a flashlight or whatever that has good lighting and I'm going to go from top to bottom and I am going to shine this on the car to make sure that we don't have areas that look splotchy or thin. We want to make sure we have full coverage and everything looks no different. Some people think 
that if we clear it, it's going to make it look better. Well, if it looks like crap before you clear it, you just locked in the crap. There's one, you can see, well, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but it's already dry where we started because we're not putting a ton of material on, even though it is a little bit bigger of a drop, it's not a ton of a difference. It just looks a little hazy. But don't worry, this is gonna come alive when we get to the clear coat. It just looks black right now, but it's gonna pop.
Okay, we got two down already. It moves along pretty quick. We're just going to do the exterior now. I'm not going to worry about the door jams or hood or trunk jams. The biggest thing is that people get tiger stripes or modeling because usually they don't have enough paint on the car. Make sure you have enough coats that you can't see a difference and then worry about the metallic orientation last. So here we go, last coat. We've got three full orientation coats. So all together we have three wet coats for coverage and three, I don't want to call them dry coats because people get mistaken by that, but three orientation coats. It's a bigger, wetter droplet. Well, what do you have to take into consideration is that even though it kind of looks uniform, we need to make sure that this is completely dry before we go into clear coat. Reason being, waterborne, well, regardless, whether you're using waterborne or solvent, you need to make sure that the base coat is completely dry or you're gonna have solvent pop. So with the car being done, we're gonna go out here, clean the gun and mix up some clear and we'll talk about that process next. All right, I, t I mentioned before, we've done those last three uh, orientation coats for the metallics to lay right. Now we just wanna ensure, this is a sunlight that we got at Harbor Freight. You can actually order these online, you just don't see them in the store. They're a lot more affordable than your average sunlight. But what we're doing here is we're taking this light and we are moving it top to bottom, side to side, and we just are looking for any inconsistent paint patterns. If you see a stripe, if you see a flake where it shouldn't be, whatever it may be, we want everything to look completely uniform before we jump into doing the clear. I've gone around, we've verified everything on this car is ready to go. We do have to make sure this is completely dry. I can't stress that enough. So let's go over the table and let's talk about some clear. We have verified that all of the base coat is uniform. We don't have any areas that look thin or modely. All the metallics have orientated correctly. And now it's time to clear the car. Make sure I cannot stress that enough that all of your base coat is completely dry. What's cool about putting that 5% of the modifier into your base coat, the hardener, it gives you time. You don't have this very short window where you have to clear the car over the base within a certain parameter. It gives you, don't quote me, I forget exactly what it is, but it definitely gives you a few days to be able to clear the car. Now, although I do not agree with that, I know that as long as that has flashed completely off and it's dry, I do like to typically give them overnight. It's already headed into the afternoon right now. And a lot of times I like to let the base coat completely gas off. What is gas off if you guys are new to this? Gassing off is as you add reducer, whether it be solvent based, whether it be water based, as you spray it, the reducer is what is making it sprayable. It's thinning it out to make it come out of the gun. When you do that, those reducers have to leave the surface. And what those uh, reducers do is they gas off and they go to the ceiling in the booth. Well, how many guys have sprayed a car, it looked great, and then they got done, shut everything down, went to bed, come out the next day, and the whole car looks hazy. What you're seeing is solvent pop. Those reducers have to exit the surface and they need to be sucked out by either a booth or what I typically do is I let them completely dry for a few hours with the booth on or if it's in your garage, just keep the fans circulating. I'll put even a couple fans around the car and out the side door. Your neighbors are gonna love you, but it's at least getting the solvents out of the shop to where they're not gonna settle back down on your perfect paint job. When you go and you try to put clear coat over base coat that's not fully dry, that reducer for that base coat still has to exit. So if you start hitting it with clear that has a hardener, it's gonna harden faster than all of your base coats and primers do. And when it does that, it's going to exit through the clear and it's gonna make it look like tiny little pinholes. That's solvent pop too. There's different variations of things that can happen. 
I found all of these things out the hard way. Again, I was not in collision. I didn't do this every day. This has strictly been custom cars and restoration for 25 years of heartache. That is what all of this knowledge is that you guys are getting. So if you guys have something to contribute, by all means, put them in the comments. Or if you have a question that you're having an issue and I didn't cover it, ask away. What I do like is I like PPG's Vibrance Clear. It's the VC5700. It is a high solid clear. What does that mean? High solids means it has a higher content of resins. That is what is staying on the car. It is not a high solvent, which has a lot more thinner uh, consistency. So if you were using like a four to one collision clear, maybe you're using a shop line or whatever brand you like, it's gonna be a lot thinner the protection isn't there, and you're gonna hear guys talk about UV protectants. Um, and really, UV protectants rise to the top of the clear, and when you color sand and polish, technically you're taking the UV protectants off of it. So, what's your UV protectants really doing? I like to pick a high solid clear. This is a two to one to half, and by half I mean we're using the two to one ratio scale on our bucket, I always like to, sometimes my eyes are playing tricks on me, I like to come in and find our two to one to one ratio, and I just outline it that way. Every time I mix it, I know where I'm looking. I'm gonna mix up for sure at least a half of that gallon to start because I know that's what it's gonna take to at least get around it. And then when I get closer, I might mix it just by the cup. Um, again, we're doing the clear, then the hardener, then the reducer. So if you're saying two one half, I'm sorry, two one one on the mix ratio for this, I'm thinking of VP 2050. Two one one, it's pretty simple. So you're gonna put the clear itself into the number four line, which is the highest one we can do to mix it in this pail, which is in the two column. And then you're going to put the hardener in, in the one column right next to it. So if you went to four, you're going to go to the next four. And then you have these other ones that are percentages. That's not for what we're doing. We need the other one, which is going to be way up here off to the side. And that is where we're going to put the reducer to. We're gonna mix that all up really well. I like mixing it in a big pail because the one thing that we're trying to do with clear is we are trying to keep a wet edge. Um, let's talk about flow coating. There's a lot of guys that swear by flow coating and I'm not one of those guys. And the reason is flow coating is where we clear the car. So let's just say you put three coats, four coats, whatever you want to call it for the first round of clear, meaning that session that day. And then the clear hardened and whether it be a couple days later, whatever it may be, you wet sanded all of your clear and smoothed it out. Maybe you had tape lines. Tape lines is to me the exception of the only time that I flow coat is if I'm trying to knock down a separation in colors or a tape line. But what we're going to do on this Lincoln is we're going to do, um, we're going to do four coats of this clear. And really it's more equivalent to five coats for most because I'm shooting out of a 1.4 tip and I paint very heavily. So we'll call it four to five coats, whatever you guys want to call it. And the reason that we do those back to back is because if you were to do call it three, let it dry, sand it, and then re-clear it and do another three coats. People have this mentality, this stigma where they say, I've got six, six coats of clear on that car and that's the protection that I need or that deep look. If you're looking for the deep look, I can assure you it is not in the clear. Does the clear help? Yeah. But what's actually giving you the depth in your paint job is your body work. Your metal work, your body work, all of the stuff that you're doing to set up to get that very flat finish. When you're looking at your lights, you need to be using a long tubular light that you can see in your paint job in the primer before, after wet sanding, before we even get into paint to check your body work. The straighter that you can get that light in your job, the better this clear is going to look when you lay it down. But the reason that we don't flow coat is because if you did three, and then you sanded it. Well, how many did you sand off? Did you sand off one coat? Did you sand off two coat? And then you did a second round another day. You just had to re-sand the entire car 
And if you don't have a tape line, it's not necessary. The reason that people say it can't be done is because they always get solvent pop. And most of the time, it's because all of those solvents from your very first coat to your fifth coat are trying to exit. Well, what's happening with every coat is it's becoming cross-linked and it's hardening. As that top coat is hardening and you're hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, it's not allowing the solvent to get out because you're, you're hammering it with so many coats so fast. So if our TDS sheet tells us, and don't quote me, 10, 15 minutes in between flash times. I didn't look at this one and I spray it all the time because I do a different method and that's the touch, the tack test. Tack test, I can put down a coat, go somewhere on the car that's not seen and I can touch it with my glove. If I touch it and it is stringy, the solvents have not had enough time to gas completely off. If I touch it and my glove leaves just a print and it's just tacky, it's good to go for another round. Typically that's 10 to 15 minutes, but it depends on your temperature in your shop that day. Like today, we're already 65 degrees or so, which is like right at the minimum that I wanna spray any kind of clear at. And we use a slow hardener. We use the slowest hardener that you can get for this, which is VH7795. What that does is it keeps the clear open from getting hard. So that way it's giving you more time. Even though we're in winter season right now, it's still going to give yourself more time. Well, we're not collision. We don't have to be on a time frame. We're just looking for quality over quantity. With that, you can take this and stack it now five times. Well, if your flash time is 10 to 15 minutes and then you just put a second coat, your flash time is now longer. So how do you gauge what that length is? touch test. You touch it. It might double. The good rule of thumb is every time that you're going through a coat, you're doubling your flash time. So if it starts at 10 minutes and it was good, then make it 20 minutes. And if that's good, 40 minutes. So it could take quite a while to get through five coats, but doing them all at one time, the benefit is that if you were to do a flow coat, doing three coats, sanding it and clearing it again, if your final round only had three coats, you, don't, you do not have six coats, you have three. And the reason is if you're color sanding and polishing and you burn through to the very first round that you did the day before, it's still going to show a halo where you polished it. Where if you do all of them at one time and account for that flash time, account for the grit that you're going to be polishing. This particular car, we're going to use 600 grit to cut the clear down. And because we're using a high solid, I'm accounting for how much I'm going to sand off the car with leaving enough clear on the car where we're not gonna have something that delaminates. Most of the time when something delaminates, it's because of poor prep or they put the product on so thin that it has nothing that's going to last. With all that, we're gonna mix this up. We're gonna go to the scale here, zero everything out, zero our bucket out and dump in the half gallon. The reason that I do the, the big pail versus the single small cork cup is because we're trying to look for that wet edge. I wanna make sure that wherever I start on the car, I have enough time to go all the way around the car and grab a wet edge. You don't want to get back to that side and then where it oversprays into where you were, it's not melting in. And you'll have what looks like a dry area or overspray. Also, why I use a slow hardener. It's giving you more time to get around that tugboat of a Lincoln without having a dry edge. If you were using what, it, you know, say your paint shop tells you, hey, it's winter, you're gonna want something faster. Well, know your product, know how far you can push the limits of that. So if you're doing a show car in your garage, you might wanna paint some small parts to practice and get used to those products before you jump the gun and spending six, $700 a gallon.
The other thing I want to mention is as we put these products on the car, part of the reason that I put the 5% modifier in the base coat is so that it's a 2K. Our primer, our body filler, our, when we prime again, it's all with a hardener, two part. Then when we get to base coat, most people don't put a modifier in it. Well, you're putting something on a car that's equivalent to a spray can that does not cross link the same as if you didn't have the modifier. And now we're gonna use a clear that also has a hardener. So from start to finish, every product that you used is going to last a lot longer because it's a 2K, because it's a two part with a hardener. All right, going over here to the second floor, which is right on the money because it's two quarts to one gallon. That's exactly what it was. So now we're gonna go up here to the last number four. There we go. When you guys are shooting clear, there's isocyanides in clear. So once you pop, oh, once you pop the top, the air molecules attach to the clear. And over time, <clears throat> this clear will start turning yellow. The other thing is, it's really bad for your bloodstream and it, it goes to wherever you have moisture. So it goes to your eye sockets, it goes to if you're sweating on your skin, and it will go into your bloodstream. So it is good to wear a uh, paint suit. It's even better if you can afford the full face. We're looking into buying one right now. So if you guys have a full face setup that you like the best, I really don't wanna drag two airlines behind me like we've done in the past here. I'm looking for one of those uh, backpack deals. So if you guys have any input of what you like and why, put it in the comments. I need to get something to protect our, our uh, full face and everything rather than just a mask. Speaking of which, the mask, make sure you guys are using charcoal filters in your mask because if you're just using a dust mask, you're inhaling all of this bad stuff. Now I'm gonna set up the gun for the clear and make sure it's not going on too heavy so I don't get runs. And I'm just gonna slowly build every coat. Some guys will put on a medium wet coat in the beginning so it gets a little tacky. If you're new to clearing, I would say that's not a bad idea. Um, do what works for you guys. Me, I pretty much spray it wet right out of the gate. I just make sure that my gun is set up to where by the time it's going over the 50%, it's wetting out right in time for that second coat where it overlaps. I'll do the first one and I'll look at what the finish should be just a hint on the dry side. That way when you come back and you overlap, it just wets out. That way you get the wettest finish and every time you put another layer on, because we used waterborne, because we used a good quality sealer, we don't have any orange peel on the car. I don't wanna say any, we have a very minimal amount of orange peel. Nobody sprays perfect you're gonna have a level of orange peel on there unless you're wet sanding in between things and I don't see the benefit. So that's just me. Let's shoot some clear. Clear's in the gun. Let's turn our light on. Let's talk about setting this gun up. I already know I like 38 to 40 PSI in this particular gun. I know I still like my fan the same, one turn in. And right now, I went two turns out on the clear just to see how does it stack up next to the base coat. And let's look at what finish we get. So pick a good flat spot you can test and set up your gun with. Now, you can see I, I like to spray at a decent speed and that looks super dry. So I know I can come out to three turns. Now see how it looks, it's wet, but it's not, basically this would be like your medium wet coat if you were just getting used to clearing. So that way this would tack up and you would not get as much sags. Well, I want it to be wetter than that, especially when I come through with my second pass, I want it to completely wet out. So that we've got three, let's go to four. 
Now I like that because it's wetting out but not all the way. And then when I come back in as a 50%, you can see it completely wets out. So for me, I like four turns on my clear. You can put that in your notes. And depending on your temperature that day, you can make adjustments. Now that we have that set up, we're gonna hit everything that's hard first, do all your jams, your edges, and then come in and do your flats out on the exterior. The hard part's done. The clear, it's not really that big of a deal, to be honest. If you get a run, you sand the run out. Um, we're gonna do four coats for sure. And when we're done, we're gonna give this car ample amount of time to, to dry. It's gonna take a very long time. We're actually gonna give the car back to the builder so they can finish putting the interior and everything in it. And you guys won't see this car assembled until we do the color stand and polish video, which we'll do in the future. Also, if you're going to let this sit a long time and you've made sure everything is completely flashed off, take a tack cloth and make sure you go over the car in between those coats of flashing because if you have any kind of dust, especially if you're in your garage, get it off in between coats and it comes out so much better at the end. these tight areas that's usually where you're going to get a run so this might be where you turn your tip to try to do everything in one pass so that way you don't have excessive passes if you're not as good with that then you can dial back on your needle so you're not putting out quite as much paint the goal is one wet drip So I'll, if I have it turned, I'll do all of my uprights and then I'll flip it back to do the laterals.
don't try to get everything 100% perfect on the first coat. You got three more to do. It's gonna flow out more and more with every coat. And if you're worried about a run in some of these trunk areas where it's really hard to get, focus on going on one edge on one round. And when you come back around for the second round, point the gun in the opposite direction to get the other edge. If you try to hit it all at one time, you're probably gonna get a run.
that's pretty much how this is going to roll. We're going to do four coats, pretty much repeat exactly what we just did all the way through three more times. If you guys want to do more or less, that's completely up to you. Just know what you want to put on so that way you can account for color, sand, and polish. Four coats on the car is what we're going to end with today. I hope you guys really got something out of this. By all means, if you guys have questions, comments, you guys know where to drop them. We're not going to be showing this car again till the very end, probably in a couple months when we get it back with interior and everything in there where we back mask and we're going to go through all of the process of how we go back through with 600 grit all the way to 3000 grit, show all the steps that we go through with color sand and polish. Although we have a color sand and polish video out, we've changed just about everything that we do with that process and we're going to get you guys up to date. We have lots of paint videos coming. We have a 56 gasser, full big flake, handy paint job. We have a very, very high dollar uh, SEMA build that's coming, uh, 49 Willys that we're gonna be showing how we do the paint with that. That's also a candy paint job. We have uh, 47 Cadillac convertible. We have a beautiful pearl blue paint job we're gonna do. So if you guys haven't already, if you've got something out of this, the whole goal with what we do is to teach the details that nobody talks about and get you guys up to speed with what does it take to do a quality paint job yourself. We started in our garage and we're just trying to share the info that we've learned over 25 years. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. We'll see you guys on the next one.